1.2 elements and compounds. For this lesson, you need to look at table S in the reference tables you were given in class today. Let's move on to the lesson. Let's first start by talking about something we learned in the last lesson, specifically pure substances. Pure substances, in particular, refer to a type of matter with constant composition and constant properties throughout the sample. What I mean by constant composition and constant properties throughout the sample is that the co composition and the properties are the same throughout the sample. For example, if you drink water on a daily basis, you'll know that uh, the, the properties or the taste of the water is the same throughout the sample. Also, the composition is the same because you have water molecules everywhere in the sample. All right, so that's what I mean. Substances have constant composition and constant properties, which means that the composition and the properties are the same everywhere in the sample. The two types of substances that you'll be encountering in chemistry, which we talked about in the last lesson also, are compounds and elements. And let's see an example of each of these below down here. All right, an example um, of an element is aluminum, which is symbolized by capital A, lowercase l. Aluminum, A capital A, lowercase l. An example of a compound, on the other hand, is water, which you might drink on a daily basis, and it's, and it's symbolized by capital H to uh, capital O. All right, so that's an example of a compound, and an example of an element is aluminum. So the two types of substances are elements, such as aluminum or Al, and compounds, such as water or H2O. What you should note from these diagrams of aluminum and water is um, they have the same composition throughout. How we can tell that the composition is the same throughout is as follows. Um, both of these, both of these uh, samples have the exact same appearance throughout in terms of their patterns. For example, with aluminum, they all look the same throughout because it's all just gray circles. On the other hand, with water, um, they have the same patterns throughout because it's all four red circles. So each, sorry, each water molecule is one red circle with two white dots attached to it. All right, so that's how the composition is the same throughout for each water molecule. Each water molecule is a red sphere with two white spheres attached to it. So basically, um, both of these have the same composition throughout because they appear the exact same, and therefore, that means that they have the same properties throughout. The composition is what leads to the properties. Since aluminum looks the same throughout, since you have like four gray circles here, that means that all samples of aluminum will have like a silvery gray color. On the other hand, since all of the molecules in water look the same throughout, one red sphere or two white spheres attached to it, it all the same composition throughout, meaning water will generally be tasteless and will be clear, for example. All right, so that's what I mean. Pure substances have the same composition throughout, meaning they appear th the exact same in terms of their patterns, like four gray spheres here for water molecules. Each water molecule is one, one red sphere with two white spheres attached. And because their composition or their appearance is the same throughout in terms of their patterns, they have the same properties throughout. For example, aluminum is silvery and very shiny throughout the sample, whereas water is clear and tasteless throughout the sample. All right. Let's first talk about the first type of substance elements. So elements, first of all, um, by definition, are substances that are made up of basic single particles called atoms that all have the same atomic number. So what I mean by that is as follows. Um, elements are the most basic and fundamental thing. They, they're the simplest kind of matter you can have anywhere around. All right, so elements are made up of these basic single particles called atoms that make up everything. And they all have the same atomic number. So basically, if you have atoms with the same atomic number, you have atoms of the same element. All right? So the atomic number actually uh, is important, but we'll get into that later. But the point here is that if you have atoms with the same atomic number, you have the same element. That's because, again, elements are substances made up of very, very basic single particles called atoms um, that all have the same atomic number. And because I said, just like I said, elements are the most basic and fundamental types of matter in the universe, they cannot be broken down or decomposed by chemical change. Since they're as simple as you can get, and since they're the basic thing that makes up everything in the universe in terms of matter, they cannot be broken down or decomposed further by a chemical change because they're the simplest thing you've got. Now, there are three ways to tell if something is an element. You can first look at the um, chemical symbol, you can look at the element name, or you can look at what are known as particle diagrams. We'll go into each one of these right now. So first of all, you can look at the chemical symbol. 
how you can tell an element is present based on the chemical symbol is if you have one capital letter only. So if the chemical symbol for something, a sample of matter, has only one capital letter, you'll know that's an element. For example, we know that AG is an element, we know that AL is an element, we know that XE is an element, we know that S is an element, we know that CL is an element, and we know that H is an element. How we know that all six of these are elements is that each one of them only has one capital letter. In AG, the only capital letter is A. In AL, the only capital letter is A. In XE, the only capital letter is X. In S, the only capital letter is S. Uh, in CL, the only capital letter is C. In H, the only capital letter is H. So in all six of these cases, you know that they're all elements because they all only have one capital letter. So that's how you determine whether something's an element based on its chemical symbol. If you have one capital letter only in the chemical symbol, you know that's an element. All right, the second way we can tell something is an element is based on its um, chemical name. All right, if its chemical name is listed on table S, you'll know that's an element because table S only lists elements. So if the chemical name is listed on table S, by itself, you'll know that's an element. For example, we know that helium, xenon, and silver are all elements. How we know that is because all three of these chemical names are listed on table S by themselves. So let's take a look at table S to prove that. Let's look and see if the chemical name helium is listed on table S by itself. So if we go to uh, the table here, we see that helium is listed by itself. So therefore, since Helium is listed by itself on table S. We know that's an element. Let's look for xenon. So xenon, let's see if it's listed on table S. Yes, xenon's listed right here. Since xenon is listed on table S, it's also an element. Finally, we have silver. Let's see if silver is listed by itself on table S. Yes, since silver is listed on table S, it's also an element. So basically, if the chemical name that's listed is listed on table S, then it's definitely an element. Okay, that's the second way. If the element name is it, or rather, if the chemical name is listed on table S, it's definitely an element, okay? So since helium, xenon, and silver are listed on table S, just like they're written here, they're definitely elements. The third way you can tell if something is an element is based on its particle diagram. More specifically, if you have the same colors and the same patterns everywhere in the diagram, you know you have an element. So let's look at two examples. We have aluminum or AL and nitrogen gas or N2. So with aluminum or AL, we can just look at the particle diagram for a minute and kind of just ignore um, its chemical name and its chemical symbol. So let's lo just look at the particle diagram first. What we'll notice here is that in terms of color, all four of these are gray spheres. So do we have the same color here? Yep, they're all gray spheres. Do we have the same pattern here? Meaning do, does the appearance of whatever you have look the same? Well, we have one sphere each for the patterns. So yep, we have the same pattern because each one is a gray sphere by itself. We have the same color, which is gray, and we have the same pattern, which is one gray sphere by itself. So we have the same color and same pattern. So we know aluminum or AL definitely is an element. Let's try our second example here of an element, which is nitrogen gas or N2. All right, so let's ignore uh, this uh, chemical name and this chemical symbol format, and let's just look at the diagram. Let's see if we have the same color everywhere. Yep, we definitely have the same color everywhere because everything in here is blue. Do we have the same pattern? Well, for each like unit or sample, we see that each part has two blue spheres each. So we definitely see that the pattern is also the same. The reason why is because it's two blue spheres each. So the pattern is also the same. So we know that nitrogen gas or N2 is an element. The reason why is because you have the same colors which are blue, and we have the same pattern which is two blue spheres per unit like this. All right, so there we go. If it's the same color, same pattern, then we know that it's an element. For this sample, we know that's um, an element because you have the same color gray, and you have the same pattern, which is one gray sphere each per unit. In this sample, nitrogen gas or N2, we know that it's an element because you have the same colors, which are blue, and the same pattern, which is, which is two blue spheres attached to each other per unit. Okay, that's how you figure it out. That's all you got to do. Um, so... I also want to go over the go over how you can tell that aluminum and nitrogen gas are um, elements just based on their chemical symbols and their chemical names. So in aluminum, you see one capital letter, so you know it's an element based on its chemical symbol. For this one, you know that's an element because it has only one capital letter. The only capital letter is the N. So you know that 
and two is also an element. How you can tell based on their chemical names is that aluminum is listed on table S, which you can check on your own, and nitrogen gas. So nitrogen is listed on table S, which you can look up on your own. So therefore, you know that aluminum and nitrogen are both elements since they're listed on table S. And obviously, the third way, again, are the particle diagrams. If they have the same colors everywhere and they have the same patterns, then you know it's an element. Okay? So just remember um, everything we learned on this slide. Just to review really quick, um, elements are substances made up of single basic particles called atoms with the same atomic number. So elements are the simplest kind of substance and therefore the simplest kind of matter you can have anywhere in the universe. Um, and they're made up of these basic single particles called atoms. If the atoms um, have the same atomic number, then they're the same element. And that's, again, because subs, uh, elements are substances made up of basic single particles called atoms with the same atomic number. And since elements are the simplest kind of matter you can have in the universe, they cannot be broken down or decomposed by a chemical change. How you can tell that something's an element is based on it having one capital letter only in its chemical symbol, its element name or chemical name being listed on table S, and um, the particle diagram having the same color and the same patterns everywhere. Okay? There you go. Now let's talk about compounds. Compounds are a little more complex than elements. Compounds specifically are substances that are chemically combined from atoms of different elements in what are known as fixed ratios by mass. So basically what that means is that compounds have atoms of two or more elements chemically combining with each other in what are known as fixed ratios. So you take atoms of different elements and you chemically combine them or basically you chemically join them together and they're combined in fixed ratios by mass. What I mean by fixed ratios are that it always has the same amount of each element. Ratios you know means like a comparison of two or more things and um, fixed means it's always the same. So to put together fixed ratios means it always has the same amount of each element in the compound. For example, water will always have one O and two H's which is why the chemical formula for water is H2O. You will never have three H's and one O in water. It will always be two H's and one O in water. All right, that's what I mean by fixed ratio. It always has the same amount of each element. Similarly, ammonia always has one N and three H's. It's never one N, four H's. It's always one N, three H's. That's what I mean by fixed ratios. You always have to have the same exact amount of each ele element in the compound. All right. In addition to that, what I want you to know is that um, since compounds are formed chemically from combining atoms of different elements in fixed ratios, um, you can actually break down compounds or decompose them by a chemical change. And that's because since uh, compounds form chemically by combining atoms of different elements, you can break down that compound into the elements that actually made it up. For example, if you have you know, two atoms of H and one atom of O, you can break that down into two atoms of H, one, M, one atom of O. All right? So since compounds are made up of atoms of different elements, you can break them down or decompose them chemically into simpler things. More specifically, you can break them down to the elements that made them up. Finally, what I want you to know is that since compounds contain atoms of different elements chemically combining in fixed ratios, the substance's properties change. The reason why the substance's properties change is because they're chemically changed when combined. So let me talk about that like kind of using a more practical example, but for now just know that substances' properties change because um, atoms of different elements are chemically changed when they're combined. For example, hydrogen, you might not know this, but hydrogen naturally at room temperature is a gas and oxygen, naturally room temperature, is a gas. And they're, they both have really weird properties. But all of a sudden, when they combine together, they make H2O, and all of a sudden it's liquid and it's very stable. So what, what I'm showing there is that hydrogen and oxygen have their properties change when they chemically combine to form H2O. So, whenever subs so what I mean is that um, compounds have substances whose properties change because when you combine two or more elements, their uh, composition changes. If you combine hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, their properties change when you make, make H2O. You go from a gas all of a sudden to a liquid that's very stable out of nowhere. So just remember, with compounds, the substances that make them up have their properties change because the properties are chemically changed when two or more things combine to make a compound. All right? 
Now let's talk about three ways to determine whether something is a compound. The three ways in which you can determine whether something is a compound is by looking at the chemical symbol, the chemical name, or um, by looking at the particle diagrams. So let's go through each one of these. First, how you can tell whether something is a compound by its chemical symbol is when it has two or more capital letters. So if the chemical symbol for um, a substance has two or more capital letters, you'll know that it is a compound. All right, uh, so three examples of compounds based on the chemical symbols are NaCl, MgO, and H2O. And how you know that these three are compounds is that each one of these has two or more capital letters. So in NaCl, I have two capital letters, Na and C. In MgO, I have two capital letters, capital M and capital O. And in H2O, I have two capital letters, capital H and capital O. So based on the fact that each one of these has two or more capital letters, we know that each one of these um, is a compound because each one of these has two or more capital letters. All right, so that's the first way. The second way to tell whether something is a compound is based on its chemical name. Specifically, if its chemical name is not listed on table S, then it is a compound. For example, ammonia, methane, and water we know are not compounds. How we know that is if you look up ammonia, nowhere is it on table S. If you look up the chemical uh, name methane, it's nowhere on table S. And if you look up water, its chemical name is definitely not anywhere on table S. Since these three chemical sounding names are not listed on table S, they're definitely compounds. All right, so that's how you can tell whether something's a compound based on its chemical name. If its chemical name, and it sounds chemistry-ish, is not listed on table S, it is a compound. Okay, so that's how you know. Ammonia, methane, and water have chemical names not listed in table S, so they're compounds. The third way you can tell whether something is a compound is based on its particle diagram. Specifically, if you have different colors that are attached to each other, but you still have the same patterns, then you have a compound. For example, we have uh, water H2O and ammonia or NH3 down here. So let's see how that works. For water, first of all, without even looking at the chemical um, name or the chemical symbols or the chemical formula, we can just look at the particle diagram and tell that's a compound. How we can tell that is, first of all, let's see if we have different colors attached per unit. In this unit, we have, or rather, in each of these four units, which I'm going to circle right now, um, we have one sphere that's red attached to two spheres that are white. All right, so notice that we already have different colors. We can already see that. There's one red sphere and two red spheres per unit. So do we have different colors to attach to each other? Yep, because each unit contains a red sphere and two white spheres attached to it. So we know we have different colors attached to one another. In terms of patterns, let's see if it's the same. Each one of these units has one red sphere attached to two white spheres. That repeats four times. Since it repeats four times, we know it's a pattern. Therefore, we know definitely, yep, we got the same pattern for this particle diagram. Each pattern is one red sphere attached to two white spheres. That's the same pattern. The different colors attached, obviously, are one red sphere attached to two white spheres each per unit. So, therefore, we're done. We know this is a particle diagram of a compound just based on the fact that we have different colors attached, red and white, and that we have the same patterns throughout. One red sphere attached to two white spheres. So water is definitely a compound. Even without looking at its chemical name or uh, formula, we can tell just based on the particle diagrams. For ammonia, we can also tell it's a particle diagram just based on its... Uh, sorry, we can tell it's a compound just based on its particle diagram without even looking at its chemical name or its chemical formula or its chemical symbols. How we can tell that is let's look at this particle diagram. So let's circle each of these uh, units, right? If we circle each of these units, let's analyze them and see if we have a compound. Do we have different colors attached? Yep, and I'll tell you how. We have one blue sphere attached to three white spheres per unit. So the different colors are blue and three white spheres. So, yep, we definitely got different colors. Blue attached to three white. And the uh, do we have the same patterns throughout per unit? Well, let's look at each unit. This unit has one blue and three white spheres. This one has one blue and three white spheres. This one has one blue and three white spheres. So do we have the same patterns? Yep, because each of these units has one blue, three white, one blue, three white, one blue, three white. So we have the same pattern. So yep, that 
qualification is also satisfied. Therefore, we know that this particle diagram represents a compound because we have the different colors attached, blue and white, and we have the same pattern in each unit. One blue, three white, one blue, three white, one blue, three white. All right? And therefore, ammonia or NH3 is also a compound. That's how we know using particle diagrams. Do they have different colors attached to each other? Do they have the same patterns repeating throughout in each unit? If so, then we definitely have a compound in terms of the particle diagram. All right? So that's how you know. And let me just analyze water or H2O and ammonia or NH3 in terms of uh, their chemical symbols and their chemical names. So first of all, in terms of chemical names, we know water and ammonia, as I just stated before, are not listed on table S and they sound chemistry-ish. Since they're not listed on table S, they're definitely compounds. In terms of, um, in terms of telling them apart symbolically from elements, we can see that H2O and NH3 are compounds. How do we know? Each one of these has two or more capital letters. The two capital letters in H2O are capital H and capital O, so we know it's a compound. For NH3, we have two capital letters, capital N and capital H, so that's how we know it's a compound. All right? So water and ammonia are both compounds because their chemical names not listed in table S, and they're both compounds also in terms of their symbols because each of their symbols for the compounds have two or more capital letters each. All right, so just to review the slide really quickly, compounds are substances that are chemically combined from atoms to different elements in fixed ratios by mass. All right, what I mean by that is um, compounds form from atoms to different elements chemically by joining the atoms of the different elements together. And they're combined in fixed ratios by mass. What I mean by fixed ratios is they always have the same amount of each substance. For example, water must always have one O and two H no matter what. Since compounds have atoms of different elements chemically combined or joined together, they can be broken down or decomposed by a chemical change back into their original elements that make them up. And um, the substance's properties change when you form a compound because you um, chemically change what it is when you combine the uh, atoms of the different elements. So the substance's properties change when you form the compound because the, um, the properties of the individual substances chemically change. For example, with hydrogen and oxygen, they're both gases at room temperature. And they, they're very weird and unstable and they kind of float around. But all of a sudden when you join them to form water, they're stable and they form a liquid and all of that good business, right? Um, how you can tell them apart from elements in terms of their symbols and their names and their particle diagrams is if you have two or more capital letters, you know it's a compound. If it's a chemical name not listed in table S, you know it's a compound. And in terms of particle diagrams, if you have the different colors attached, but you have the same patterns repeating throughout, you know it's a compound. All right, so there you go. Now let's talk about how to represent elements and compounds. I've been mentioning particle diagrams a lot. The way I can define this as as follows. Particle diagrams simply just mean diagrams that show how particles are attached and arranged in a box. That's all it is. A diagram showing how particles are attached and arranged. All right, how do you draw them? Well, let's go through these one by one. But before we do it, let's review particle diagrams of elements and compare that to particle diagrams of compounds. Let's remember for particle diagrams of elements, you need to have the same colors and same patterns throughout. For compounds, you have to have different colors attached to each other, but the same patterns repeating throughout. That's how you know. Okay, there you go. Um, how you draw them is uh, you have to pick one color for each element. In compounds, obviously, attach different colors when you're making a compound. Uh, in elements, make sure you attach the same colors to each other, because obviously it's an element. Compounds have different colors, elements have same colors. And remember to pick one color for each element because you have to be able to tell the elements apart. All right, so let's look at some examples of um, particle diagrams for elements. For example, with copper or Cu, we know it's an element, first of all, because you have one capital letter and copper is a chemical name listed on table S. How we can represent atoms of copper is, I'm just going to represent copper using um, one green sphere each like this, right? So one green sphere, one green sphere, one green sphere, one green sphere, right? So we have the same color, one green sphere each. So we know we have the same color. We have the same patterns, one green sphere each. Since we have the same colors, one green, uh, since we have the same colors green and we have the same patterns, one green sphere each, we know that copper is an element. For oxygen gas or O2, I know it's an element because there's one capital letter, capital O, and oxygen is a chemical name listed on table S. Right? How I represent O2 is I attach two of the same colors together, just like I saw in these instructions up here. So I'm going to say 
one atom of oxygen is red, right? So one, ox one atom of oxygen is a red sphere. So for O2, I'm going to attach two red spheres to one another, like so, right? So this is uh, O2 for oxygen gas. Then I'm going to draw another O2. So I draw two red spheres based on this number two down here, and I'm going to draw two reds since it's oxygen, and oxygen is red. Again, I'm going to draw two reds since there's a number two down there, and I'm going to draw um, them in red since red represents the color for oxygen. So um, that's how I drew O2. I attached two of the same color together if uh, it's O2. For O3, obviously, you'd attach three of the same color together and so on and so forth. It's really easy. Just look at the number to tell you how many of them you have to attach. And obviously, uh, put the uh, element in a certain color. For oxygen, I chose red. And since it's O2, I attach two reds together. Right? And obviously, I know oxygen, gas, or O2 is an element based on the particle diagram alone because you have the same colors, which are red, and the same patterns, which are two red particles that attach to each other per unit. Two red particles attached to each other here, two red particles attached to each other here, and two red particles attached to each other here. Same color red, and the same pattern, two red particles attached to each other in each unit. Right? For the particle diagram of the compounds, obviously, you have to attach different colors. Uh, let's say you have carbon dioxide or CO2. I know it's a compound because you have two capital R, C and O. You know that it's a compound based on its chemical name because it's a chemical name not listed on table S. How I represent carbon dioxide is I have one C, since there's no number next to it, and two O's, right? So what I do is I'll represent carbon using black, like I did here, and I'll represent each oxygen using red, like I did on the sides. So I put one black carbon in the middle and two red oxygens on the sides, like so, right? So that's how I represented CO2. C is black, O is red. So I put one C and two red O's. So I attach different colors, one black C and two red O's. Then since it's a compound, I have to repeat the pattern, obviously. One black C, two red O's. One black C, and two red O's, according to the formula. One C, two O's. I know this is a compound based on the particle diagram alone, because um, you have different colors attached, black and red, and you have the same patterns repeating throughout. You have one black C it attached to two red O's. One black C attached to two red O's. One black C attached to two red O's. There you go. Next, we have nitrogen monoxide, or NO. Since there's no number next to N or O, we know that there's one of each, one N, one O. I'm going to make N blue. I'm going to make O red, right? So what I have to do for NO is obviously I have to attach two different colors to each other as per the directions shown up here, right? So um, I have to attach different colors, one blue N to one red O. So I attach one blue N to one red O. That's one uh, unit of NO. Again, since it's a compound, I repeat the pattern. One blue N, one red O. Again, I repeat it, the pattern since it's a compound, so I put one blue N, one red O. So there you go. These are the particles of NO. So remember, again, just like I did on this slide, um, pick one color for each element. Compounds, pick one color for each element, then attach to different colors based on how many numbers they say in the formula. For example, with CO2, I put one black C and two red O's. The reason why is because there's no number next to C, so I know there's one. I know there are two red O's since there's a number two next to O. For nitrogen monoxide, I know that there's no number next to N or O, so I know there's one of each. So I put one blue and one red O. Right? How I know that this is a compound down here is that um, I have different colors attached. One blue N, one red O. How I know that it's also a compound is that the patterns are the same. In each unit of these, I have one blue and one red O, one blue and one red O, one blue and one red O. Since the pattern repeats, I know that this alone, based on the particle diagram, without even looking at any of this down here, makes it a compound. All right, so there you go. Now let's just really quickly review how to represent elements and compounds. Let's remember that um, to represent elements and compounds, you have to pick one color for each element. So when you have more than one particle in a specific unit, then um, make sure you attach different colors for compounds, and for elements, make sure you attach the same colors. All right, with copper, I chose green, and since it's only 
one CU, I just represent that by putting um, one sphere per atom of CU, right? Or per unit of CU. Um, and then for oxygen gas, since it's O2, I choose that O is red, and since there's a number two down here, I put two red spheres in each unit of O2, where the red represents oxygen, and there are two of them to match up to this number two in the formula. In this chemical formula, I have CO2. I chose uh, black as the color for carbon, and uh, O as the color for oxygen, and, I, and since there's a number two, I put two oxygen spheres on each carbon, right? So in summary, how I represent that is I have um, one black sphere and two red spheres. That means one black carbon, two red oxygens, one black carbon, two red oxygens, one black carbon, two red oxygens. All right, uh, with nitrogen monoxide, I chose a blue to represent N and red to represent O. So with nitrogen monoxide or NO, um, in each unit, obviously, I have to have one N, one O or one blue and one red O. So in this unit, I put one blue, one red, one red, one blue, sorry, one blue N, one red O. One blue N, one red O. One blue N, one red O. All right? So make sure that each unit or, like, thing that you're drawing and repeating in your um, box represents the number of atoms and the proper colors of the atoms you're trying to represent. So make sure you represent colors properly and numbers of atoms properly. For example, with copper, in each unit I only have one green Cu because there's no number next to Cu. So each unit has one green Cu. Since the chemical formula here is O2, I draw two red O's in each unit. In this one, I have CO2, so I draw one black C and two red O's in each unit. Right? So here I have NO and N is blue, O is red. So I draw one blue N, one red O in each unit. So make sure the colors and the numbers of each atom are matched and repeated in each unit or thing in your particle diagram. All right? For compounds, attach different colors. For elements, attach the same colors. And let's remember, um, same colors, same patterns means you have an element. On the other hand, different colors and the same patterns means you have a compound. All right, so let's go through the guide to practice questions now. It says um, in number one, which four substances cannot be broken down by chemical change from the following list? So let's note that the only types of substances that cannot be broken down by chemical change are elements. So basically, we just have to find the four elements in the list, right? Because elements cannot be broken down by chemical change. So I wrote that at the end here. Since elements can't be broken down by chemical change, we have to find the four elements. So let's see... Um, first with these chemical names, whether they are elements. Actually, sorry, with these uh, five chemical names, whether they are elements. Ammonia is not a chemical name list on Table S, so therefore it's not an element. You can check that on your own. Manganese, however, is a chemical name list on Table S, so it is an element. That's the first element we find in the list. Propane is not listed on Table S, so it's not an element. Silicon, however, is, so it is a chemical element, because it's a, it's a uh, chemical name listed on Table S. So, so far we have uh, manganese and silicon as the elements because they're chemical names listed on table S, just as they're written. Water is not a chemical name listed on table S, so it's definitely not an element. So the only two elements we have from the uh, chemical names list are manganese and silicon, and again, that's because they are, they're chemical names listed on table S. Now, when we're looking at symbols or chemical formulas, we have to find, um, what is it, we have to find, um, chemical symbols with only one capital letter. So let's find out which ones have one capital letter, find out which, one, one, which ones are elements. Capital C, capital O, definitely not. Because that's two capital letters, it's not an element. CO, however, is an element because it only has one capital letter, and that capital letter is capital C. So CO is the first element we find, since it has one capital letter. AS is also an element because it only has one capital letter in its formula, which is the capital A. So that works too. HF, nope, there's two capital letters. HBR, nope, there's two capital letters. So the only two uh, chemical formulas that are elements are CO and AS because they each only have one capital letter, which means they're elements. In CO, the capital letter is C, and in AS, the capital letter is A. All right? That's how you know that some things um, cannot be broken down. It can't be broken down, so it must be an element. How you know something's an element in a chemical formula 
is um, or symbolically is that it has only one, one capital letter. How do you know that from the chemical name is if the chemical name is listed in table S. That's where the elements are listed. All right. Number two says which substances can be decomposed chemically and are chemically combined in fixed ratios by mass. So if they can be decomposed chemically and are chemically combined in fixed ratios by mass, we know that by definition that must be a compound. That's a definition we should know and memorize very well. So uh, we know that the substances we're picking from the list have to be compounds. How we know something's a compound in terms of the chemical name is if it's a chemical name not listed on table S. So let's go through each one of these chemical names and find out whether they're listed on table S. Tin is listed on table S, so that makes an, makes it an element, not a compound. So tin doesn't work. It's not a compound. Antimony is also listed on table S, so it's an el element, not a compound. Ammonia, however, is not listed on table S, and it's a chemical name, so it is a compound. So that's our first compound in terms of chemical names. Oxygen is a uh, chemical name on table S, so it's an element, not a compound. Propane, however, is a chemical name not listed on table S, so it's a compound as well. All right, so if the chemical name is not listed on table S, it's a compound, obviously. Now, in terms of chemical formulas or symbols, if it has two or more capital letters in the uh, formula, we know it's a compound. So let's look for two or more capital letters in the chemical formula so that we know that we have a compound. Capital N, capital O, yep, that's a compound because we have one capital N, one capital O. So that's our first uh, compound, N-O, because it's capital N, capital O, two capital letters or more, makes it a compound. MN has only one capital letter, nope, it's an element, since it has only one capital letter. CO, yep, it has two capital letters, capital C, capital O, so that makes it a compound, because two or more capital letters in the chemical formula makes it a compound. HE, one capital letter, so it's an element, not a compound. XE, nope. As one capital letter, so it's just a compound. So the two uh, chemical formulas or symbols that we know that are compounds are NO and CO because they have two or more capital letters, which make them compounds. All right. Number three says identify one substance in the following chemical reaction that cannot be broken down chemically. Since it cannot be broken down chemically, we know that by definition it is an element, since that's the definition we should know. In other words, elements can't be broken down chemically. So we have to find out which of, which from this um, equ chemical equation, which you'll be learning about later, is um, an element or cannot be broken down by chemical change. And since these are all symbols, we, have to, we can identify the element by looking for which one or which thing in here has um, only one capital letter because that's how we tell using chemical symbols that we have an element. That is, we can tell an element is in a chemical symbol if there's only one capital letter. So let's go through the passage. AL. Oh, there's our answer already. You know why? Because we have one capital letter. Since we have one capital letter, we know that this is an element, right? So that is a substance that cannot be broken down chemically. So AL or aluminum is the, is the uh, substance that cannot be broken down chemically. That is because elements cannot be broken down chemically. How we know AL or aluminum is an element is because it is only one capital letter in the formula. All right, and again, elements can't be broken down chemically. Another possibility is H2, because it too also has one capital letter, so we know it's an element. All right, that's another possibility. Those are the two possibilities there. Number four says, classify the following as being an element or a compound and describe whether it can be broken down chemically. So let's remember, compounds have different colors attached, but we have the same pattern. And elements have the same colors attached to each other with the same patterns. So in this first one, we have one white, one black dot, one white, one black dot, one white, one black dot, and one white, one black dot. So we can see that two different colors are attached, one black, one white. Since you have uh, different colors attached, we think it's a compound. How we can verify that is, are there the same patterns in each of these four units I circled? Yes, because each unit has one black, one white, one black, one white, one black, one white, one black, one white. Therefore, this first substance is a compound. The second substance, let's see what it is. Let's circle each unit and analyze each one. Um, each unit, as we can see, has two white circles attached to each other. So we see that we have two of the same color attached to each other, two white circles. So we have the same colors. Do we have the same patterns? Well, yeah, we have two white circles attached to each other in each unit I circled. So therefore, we have the same patterns as well, two white circles attached to each other, same colors, two whites. 
since it's um, the same color, two whites, and the same patterns, two white circles attach to each other, we know that this substance is an element. And number three, we know that this is also an element, and let's see why. We have the same colors uh, in each unit or each circle I put. We see that we have um, the same color, one blue circle, and we have the same pattern, one blue singular circle. Since we have the same color, blue, and the same pattern, one blue singular circle in each unit I circled, we know that this is an element. In this fourth one, we know it's an element, let's see why. Let's circle each unit that we see and analyze it. Now, each unit I circled has the same colors, which are all blues in each uh, thing I circled. And each unit also has the same patterns, three blue circles, right? So since we have the same colors, blue, all blue in each uh, unit I circled, and the same patterns, three blue circles in each unit I circled, uh, we know that this is an element. Finally, for this one, we can analyze this. Um, it should be colored a little differently. I'm sorry, that's my fault. So for now, I'm just going to color this blue for fun, just so you guys can tell the difference. All right, so I apologize. But you know that this fifth and final substance is a compound. Let's see why. Um, let's circle each unit and then analyze it. So if we circle each unit and analyze it, we'll see the following. Um, each unit has different colors. We see one blue, two whites. One blue, two whites. One blue, two whites. So we see different colors. One blue, two whites. And we also had the same pattern. One blue, two whites in each uh, unit I circled. Since we have the si different colors attached, blue and white, and we have the same pattern, one blue, two white, in each unit I circled, we know it's a compound. Again, just to make the last one a little more clear, you have different colors attached, blue and white, in each unit. And we have the same patterns, one blue, two white, in each unit I circled. Since you have different colors, blue and white, and the same pattern, one blue, two white, in each unit I circled, we know it's a compound. All right, now to answer the second part of the question, all both compounds here on the outsides can be broken down chemically, obviously, because they consist of atoms of different elements combined in fixed ratios um, by mass. On the other hand, these three elements in the middle cannot be broken down chemically, and that's because they're the simplest kind of um, matter you have. They're made up of elements, which are the simplest particles you can have in the universe, more or less. We can think of that that way right now, so elements obviously cannot be broken down chemically. And let's just remember, um, again, compounds, in addition to be, being able to be broken down chemically, are combined in fixed ratios by mass chemically. All right, so just remember compounds can be broken down chemically because they're made up of atoms of different elements and they're combined chemically in fixed ratios by mass. Elements, on the other hand, cannot be broken down chemically because they're made up of the simplest types of particles you can find in the universe known as atoms. Please complete these homework questions on your own and for number six, please make sure that you use the legend here shown to draw the particle diagrams. Remember with compounds you attach different colors and you look at the numbers to find out how much there are of each element. Uh, for um, elements, just make sure you attach the same colors to each other. All right, please complete these homework questions on your own for the next class. Thank you very much.